Hi guys, Dane here, and welcome to part number three of My Cat Picks My TBR. So I've just decided this is basically just a guaranteed ongoing series now. Uh, we'll get Biggie to pick some books for me, and then in the same video I will review them at the end. So you're watching me now, I'm going to film Biggie picking some books whenever he decides to grace me with his presence. And then I'll kind of recap what those books are, and then I'm going to go away, read them, and then come back and review them. So let's do it. Biggie, come on then, we're, we're gonna pick some books, mate. You gonna help me? Okay, let's start with these three. Come on then, bud. So, I need you to pick from one of these books. So we've got Hercule Poirot's Christmas by Agatha Christie. Could read it in June, why not? Everything's Eventual by Stephen King. And Talk to the Hand by Lynn Truss. Now, I actually kind of want... To, uh, in fact, these are the three that are due for me to just read next. Okay, watch out then. We're ready. Oh man, you went straight for Lynn Trust, didn't you? Is that the one you wanted, was it? So you picked Talk to the Hand by Lynn Trust, which oddly is literally the book I was going to read next anyway. Okay. So, our next choices, we have Inferno by Dan Brown, Insomnia by Stephen King, and If You Liked School, You'll Love Work by Irvin Welsh. Go on in, cat. All right, then. We're ready. You had the one on that one. You've already picked that one. You've got to pick one of these three. One of these three, look. Which one? Which one do you think? Which one are you going for? That's the bag. Oh, okay, you got one. Yeah, okay. So Biggie picked If You Liked School, You'll Love Work by Irvin Welsh. I notice he's, all, he's just going for the ones on the right. Is that your thing? Do you just like the ones on the right? Okay, here we have Alien by Alan Dean Foster, Nightmares and Dreamscapes by Stephen King, and Porno by Irvin Welsh. Seeing as you've already picked one, Irvin Welsh, mate, I'd prefer it if you didn't pick another, but it's, it's up to you. Those are the two you've already picked. You need to pick a new one from over here, look. That's, you're going straight for the bag again. You haven't figured out how this works yet, have you, Biggie? Look, you can have some more when you're done. You just need to, you just need to pick one of these three first, don't you? Oh, okay. So you've picked Nightmares and Dreamscapes by Stephen King. So it's not always the ones on the right then. Come on, Nim. Come on. Good boy. Yeah. Yeah. Don't slobber on my book. You've slobbered all over my book. Okay, I'm back. So as you can see, he uh, picked three books for me. So he picked Talk to the Hand by Lynn Truss. Lynn Truss wrote a book called Eat Shoots and Leaves about like grammar and punctuation that was quite popular for a while. And the subtitle of this is The Utter Bloody Rudeness of Everyday Life, or Six Good Reasons to Stay Home and Bolt the Door. And uh, yeah, it looks really beautiful inside as well. Like I just like the typesetting and the layout and stuff. So this was actually gonna be my, my next book anyway. And uh, yeah, like Lynn Trust, she's great. This has been my third of her books. I also read one called Making the Cat Laugh, appropriately enough. So I think, I think Lynn Trust, if she's watching this, she will appreciate this video. Uh, then he picked If You Liked School, You'll Love Work by Irvin Welsh. So Welsh is one of those authors where I've read like, probably like 70% of his books. But they're just a few that I've owned for a while that I've just not got to. And like a few of his newer ones. Actually, this looks not too bad at all. Because look at the size of that print, look. So it's 380 pages, and I've been putting this off because I've been like, this This is a massive book. This is going to take me forever. <laughs> and it looks like it's going to take me two days. <laughs> so maybe I should have looked inside this one. So that's a solid pick as well. I think, uh, what is it, I'm filming on a Sunday, and I suspect by Thursday evening I'll have read both of these. Um, which is good, because then his third pick is Nightmares and Dreamscapes by Stephen King, which is... Uh, 836 pages long. <laughs> Luckily, I am travelling this weekend as well, so that will help me to get through it. And I did look inside. I mean, it's it's dense, but it's not too dense, you know? It's got an image of a house for the house on Maple Street. So that's kind of cool. But, uh, yeah, there's also, actually, I noticed, I was looking at the contents to see if I'd read any of the stories elsewhere or whatever, and I don't think I do. But there's a story in this called The Moving Finger. And Agatha Christie has a novel, or maybe a short story, called The Moving Finger as well. 
Uh, but yeah, this also holds the distinction of the book that I've owned the longest without reading. I've owned this since 2010. So, it is about time. And that, again, is another solid pick. He's really good at doing these picks, man. Uh, and so far, the lowest rating, I've now read seven books that my cat's picked for me. And the lowest rating I've given any of them was 3.75 out of 5. I don't think there's been any five stars, though. I, th I think all the other six were all four out of five. So but that's where I'm at. So I'm off to go and read these books, and I will update you probably in like a week's time. All right, see you in a bit. All right, so I've read the first of the three books that Biggie picked. That would be Talk to the Hand, The Utter Bloody Rudeness of Everyday Life, or Six Good Reasons to Stay Home and Bolt the Door. I'll read you the blurb. This book is, obviously, a big systematic moan about modern life, and the expression Talk to the Hand sort of yokes it all together. Talk to the Hand specifically alludes to a response of staggering rudeness, best known from the Jerry Springer show. Talk to the Hand because the face ain't listening. Accompanied by an aggressive palm held out at arm's length. So Lynn Truss wrote Eat, Shoots and Leaves, which is about punctuation. She also wrote Making the Cat Laugh, which I really enjoyed, which was like a memoir of her being a kind of a cat lady. This one was her follow-up to uh, Eat, Shoots and Leaves, and I was really expected to enjoy it, and I was very, very disappointed. And actually, when I posted my reviews to Goodreads and Amazon, it turns out I'm not the only one. And I think on Goodreads, it has an average of like 3.3. And on Amazon, it was an average of 3, which is pretty shoddy, to be honest. And I think the problem of this is that she's just complaining. But like, it, quite often, she's complaining for the sake of complaining. So she's talking about all the different things that she hates about everyday life. And one of them was like people with visible tattoos or people who smoke cigarettes in public. And it's like, well... People don't smoke cigarettes inside, you know, or like people who talk on their phone in public. I, I just, I'm just like, live and let live, man. Like, I just thought it was, she came across as this person who just has no tolerance for other people whatsoever. And she just wants the world to be her own way. And she, if you don't agree with her, then God help you. She does say at the beginning as well, she's like, well, this is aimed at like women of a certain age or whatever. So I'm like, well, straight away, I guess I'm not the target audience. I, I don't know. But it seems weird to have a book like this that would... Like, it just deliberately alienates all these different subgroups of people, you know? I think one of them was, like, about, like, picky eaters or something. And it's like, but... Oh, no, that was it. One of them was about, like, allergies. And, like, how, like, allergy information is, like, all over the place now. And it's like, but people have allergies. I don't, I don't understand, like, why you would... It's just, for me, she was just finding things to complain about for the sake of complaining about things. And so because of that, I just didn't enjoy it. I just didn't agree with her. And she just came across, like I say, as quite whiny and quite intolerant. And that made me sad because I didn't think she was that kind of person as well, you know? I don't know. I got the opinion that she was quite left-leaning. But here she came across as like sort of center to right politically just being like... No, you must do things in this way. And like, oh, another thing was people who say the word fuck. So throughout this, she just keeps saying F and effing. Like, and I think she did it at least 50, 60 times. And to me, that's just pointless. That's like when, you know, newspapers or whatever do F asterisk CK. It's like, we know what you're doing. You're just censoring there. Like, I don't agree that, you know, you should censor things. And also, if she's that concerned about the word, actually normalizing it takes away a lot of its power as well you know so i don't know i just i, I just no uh yeah i gave it like i gave it a 2.5 out of 5 at the time but i'm gonna downgrade that to to a 2 out of 5 which is what i gave it on amazon and goodreads and i would suggest don't read this and now i'm a little apprehensive because i wanted to read everything that she published because the first two that i read were so good and now i'm like uh, i don't I won't be going out of my way to pick up another one anyway, but if I come across one in a charity shop, it's fair game. All right, and so I'm going to love you and leave you and hand you over to another version of Future Dane. Cat, what are you doing? All right, I am back and here to talk about the other two books that Biggie picked for me. So first up, we have Nightmares and Dreamscapes by Stephen King. This is about 840 odd pages long, so it took me about a week, I think, to finish it. For the most part, I really enjoyed this. I actually gave this a four out of five. As with most short story collections, there are some that I enjoyed more than others. Also, towards the end, we had one uh, essay about baseball, like Little League Baseball, which I wasn't particularly interested in because I don't do sports. And even if I did, I don't think baseball would be my sport. But um, there was that. And then there was also a story that King wrote in the style of Raymond Chandler writing a Sherlock Holmes story. So that was kind of interesting because Watson was the one who actually solved the crime. 
But I think those two stories both could have been removed to make this just a little bit shorter and a little bit more focused as a book, I think. Having said that, there were some great stories in here as well. So I'm going to go through the index here and reflect on what I can remember. So we have the introduction as per. And we have Dolan's Cadillac, which is about this like super extravagant plan that somebody comes up with to kill somebody by like building a, a like pit trap in the road so that their Cadillac gets swallowed up. And then they plan to like cover over the top of it with earth. That was actually one of the strongest stories in this book, I think. We have The Night Flyer, which is about... It's like a vampire story, basically a more modern vampire story. So I think if you would liked and enjoyed Salem's Lot, you'd like that story. There's one called Chattery Teeth, which stood out to me going in because I know Brian at Brian's Bookshelves read this recently. In fact, I'll link to his video on it below. And uh, yeah, he mentioned that story then and that's what really stood out to me. Uh, there's a story called The Moving Finger as well, which I thought might potentially be related to... There's an Agatha Christie story called The Moving Finger. It wasn't related to that, but it was a very odd story about like this finger coming out through a plug hole and somebody trying to kill it, basically. Um, you know they got a hell of a band. That's like these people kind of drive into this sort of Twilight Zone era, small American town that's uh, called Rock and Roll Heaven. And they're being served by like, you know, um, Buddy Holly and stuff like that. Janis Joplin. What else have we got? Uh, the House on Maple Street is worth mentioning just because it includes... This sort of photograph as well, and there's actually some additional information on that in the, uh, the the notes at the end. Uh, we have the doctor's case, which is this one about uh, Watson, and then Umney's last case was interesting because that's basically following this sort of 1920s noir detective, and then suddenly the creator of his story starts to change things and then it gets a bit meta and eventually he meets his own creator and uh, that one was pretty good and I think again I think that would have been a good one to end on but uh, overall like I said this was a four out of five and a pretty pretty solid pick and also it was uh, the book that I've owned the longest without reading so it's good to tick that off and then finally we have if you liked school you'll love work by Irvin Welsh and this is another collection of short stories actually thinking about it I can read you the blurb for nightmares and dreamscapes but not for this because this one doesn't have one We'll go for the blurb on this. The Stephen King Amusement Park, an unnerving experience with rides every which way to hell and a few to glory. A solitary finger pokes out of a drain. Novelty teeth turn predatory. The Nevada desert swallows a Cadillac. Meanwhile, the legend of Castle Rock returns and grows on you. What does it all mean? What else could it mean? Stephen King is back with a powerful new collection of stories, a vast, many-chambered cave of a volume. In story after story, the long reach of Stephen King's imagination and the no-holds-barred force of his storytelling will take you to places you've never been before. On a roller coaster through the macabre monstrous, via cutting-edge explorations of good and evil, and onto a heartfelt piece on Little League Baseball. You will lose a good deal of sleep, but Stephen King, writing to beat the devil, will do your dreaming for you. Very cool. Cool blurb. So in this one uh, by Irvin Welsh, this is basically, I think, five shorter stories... Oh, we do have a blurb here, so I, I, I probably will read you this blurb. I only want to talk about two of the stories, really, because there are only two of them that I really enjoyed. Uh, as an overall thing, Welsh is sometimes difficult to read. This has, like, pretty decent spacing, I thought, but it still took me forever to get through it, especially in a couple of the stories where he writes with uh, the Scottish dialect. Having said that, I did really enjoy it. I gave it a 4 out of 5, but I also read it as a bedtime book, just doing 25 pages at a time. I think if you had this as your main book, it could become potentially off-putting. So we'll read you the blurb. Uh, in his first short story collection since The Acid House, Irvin Welsh sets us five tricky questions. In Rattlesnakes, how do three young Americans find themselves lost in the desert? And why does one find himself performing fellatio on another while being watched by the bare-breasted Madeline and two armed Mexicans? So this was actually one of my favourite ones. I might as well talk about it now. Oi, don't eat my dinner, cat. I'm wrapping up the book she picked for me, mate. So I really enjoyed that one. They're basically, uh, these kids are kind of lost on their way back from a music festival. And their car breaks down. And just as things seem as though they can't get any worse, they get worse. And so I quite like that because of that. Then next up we have, who is the mysterious Korean chef who has moved upstairs to Chicago socialite Kendra Cross in the dogs of Lincoln Park? And what does he have to do with the disappearance of her faithful po pooch Toto? This one was cool because it kind of subverts expectations and has a twist ending that is kind of almost an anti-twist I would call it. 
In the title story, can Mickey Baker, an expat English bar owner ducking and diving on the Costa Brava, manage to keep all his balls in the air, maintaining the barmaid Cynthia's body weight at the sexual maximum while attending to the youthful Persephone and dodging his persistent ex-wife and a pair of Spanish gangsters? I actually thought this one was probably the weakest one. By what train of events does Raymond Wilson Butler, writing a biography of a legendary US film director in Miss Arizona, come to end up as a piece of movie memorabilia? That one was probably the second weakest one. And how, in the novella The Kingdom of Fife, will Jason King, diminutive ex-trainee jockey and table football star of Caldenbeath, fare in the world of middle-class female equestrians? And will he ever enjoy the tender and long-anticipated charms of Jenny Cahill and her remarkable jodpers? So that one was probably my favourite one. Uh, I think that could stand alone as a novel, never mind as a novella. And, you know, that one and the first one combined made the whole thing worth reading. All of these questions are posed and answered in these five extraordinary stories. Stories that remind us that Irvin Welsh is a master of the shorter form, a brilliant storyteller, and, unarguably, one of the funniest and filthiest writers in Britain. So yeah, like I said, enjoyed this one, and it was a pretty solid four out of five. So there we have it, that's what I made of my cat's latest picks. I'm going to go ahead and film another one shortly with another three videos. Kind of hoping he picks something shorter for me, but uh, we'll see how it goes. So on that note, as always, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books, and if so, what you thought of them. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more, and Biggie and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.